I'm going to start, and I'm going to thank you uh, for coming today and say welcome. This is a panel discussion titled Impact of Independent Film on Local Communities. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to chair, moderate, and, and, and start this discussion today. Uh, I think first just a couple corrections to our program uh, and provide some background on how this panel was formed today. And introduce. And before I do in, introduce the panel, uh, regret, regrettably, Virginia Pierce with the Utah Film Commission had a conflict this afternoon and could not be here. But we will be talking about the Utah Film Cons uh, Commission, uh, what they do, and some of the statistics and data uh, behind uh, the economics of film in the state. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Michael Homer. Um, Michael is a historian. He was the past chair of state history and I think the longest running executive director of Utah State Historical Society, I think from 94 to 2014. Uh, he was scheduled to moderate on this panel today uh, with me, but had a conflict with, a, with another uh, presentation here at this conference. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, we had hoped also to maybe get um, with the KUR on the panel today, to have uh, Doug Fabrizio here today, but he also is uh, conflicted. So uh, don't don't uh, be confused. I'm not Doug Fabrizio, but I'll do my best to try and moderate and talk with this uh, great group that we've got today. Uh, Mike Homer, just by way of how this came about, uh, is a local historian. Some of you may not be familiar. He also is an, a practicing attorney. Uh, and uh, I met him uh, through some recommendations uh, back in 2010. Uh, on a uh, on a feature film and a production uh, and, a, and a feature film and, and a film fund uh, that I had out of Los Angeles, and he was re highly recommended as an attorney in Salt Lake City. From which I very quickly learned he was really a historian who pr practices law, uh, and we became fast friends. And so I moved back. I'm from Utah. I was born and raised here. Uh, I moved back to Salt Lake City from Los Angeles. Uh, I'd been there about 20 years and moved back here about 2000. And uh, through Mike and working with him and the friendship, uh, I've kind of rediscovered a state that I grew up in and a history in so many places uh, and areas that I, I really didn't know. Uh, I always had an interest in film. Uh, while my business has not been in the film industry, I've always been in some fashion around feature film, usually on the finance and the business side, uh, but always interested in photography as a hobby and it's just always been a, a very close to me. Moving back to Utah with a daughter and an interest in film and just seeing how vibrant the community is here, both in the arts and also in, in film. Uh, I became familiar with uh, uh, so many uh, stories that we probably otherwise wouldn't uh, have seen uh, had they not be coming to our, uh, our consciousness through uh, places like the Utah Film Center. And so through that relationship to film, my relationship to Mike, uh, I was asked, uh, I've been asked several times to put together some discussions for this particular conference uh, when they dealt with what uh, I felt was appropriate. This conference is on local matters. A few years ago we introduced a film here called uh, In Football We Trust. It had just screened uh, uh, not too long prior at, uh, at Sundance, focused on the local Polynesian community and that major thread uh, of, of what it's like to be a uh, uh, Polynesian, a young male football player growing up in Utah and going into professional football. Uh, it uh, did very well. Uh, I think we had a good turnout at this conference and brought a better, uh, I think, for, uh, awareness about what is happening in Salt Lake City and in Utah with film in general. And a shout out to that film, and Football We Trust uh, just won an Emmy, uh, I think was just announced within the last few weeks. So that film was also, I think, a fiscal sponsor of the Utah Film Center, uh, uh, whom we have here today. Uh, I'm pleased uh, to be able to introduce this panel. Um, uh, we have today uh, Patrick Hubble, the Director of Programming with the Utah Film Center. Diane, excuse me, Elaine Clark, she's a producer, KUER and Radio West, and filmmakers, Jordan Hackney representing Jenny McKenzie Films. Jenny this week is filming in Alabama and could not be here, and Tyler Meesom, who's a local filmmaker uh, with a variety of projects and some current ones that he's going to be bringing, talking to us about today. What I'd like to do, and in this format, is, is I'm going to start the discussion with Patrick Hubley and the Utah Film Center. 
and then we're going to move into uh, looking at uh, the filmmakers, their films. KWR and Radio West is not just a distributor of, uh, of media, radio content, uh, and, and video. It's also a producer. And I think you'll see through Elaine's presentation the relationship with the people up here today, just what an important vehicle and role KUER and Radio West is playing in this state and in the Intermountain area. So the Utah Film Center recently just celebrated a 15-year anniversary. They screen 300 or more films, independent films, every year that reach over 38,000 Utah viewers in the state. They have two annual film festivals, Tumbleweeds for Children and Youth, and Dan These Hills, a forum for LGBTQ issues, ideas, hopes, and dreams. So we're going to begin our discussion with Patrick Hugley. Uh, Patrick, welcome again. Um, please, yeah, please. please. Just, uh, I'm going to bring around, we've got a microphone, so I think we're supposed to pass this around, and then I will uh, myself try to be more available. So if you could just tell us a little bit about sure. you, the Film Center, and, and what you do as a, as a program director. So, as, thanks Kelly. Um, as, as Kelly said, I'm the director of programming for the Utah Film Center. Um, we are celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we, we're an, our, a film exhibition and education organization based here in Salt Lake City. Uh, our, w uh, we show free films. Uh, at least twice a week here in Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County. Well, we also show films in Moab, Ogden, uh, West Jordan, and in uh, Orem. So our reach is, we're trying to build our reach to be statewide, so we're presenting programming as, in as many communities as possible. We hope that one day in the future, not too distant, that we're hosting independent film screenings all over the state in every community uh, here in Utah. Um, uh, my background is I moved here from Toronto, Canada in 2000 uh, to work for the Sundance Film Festival. Uh, I left Utah for a year and then came back in, t in 2005 and came back in 2006 and, you know, had made the decision that Utah was going to be my home and uh, connected with the Utah Film Center to launch Tumbleweeds, the kids film festival that we present annually and we'll be having our seventh annual festival in March. Um, since I've been working at the, the Film Center, it's been our goal to present interesting, dynamic, and engaging films from around the world. And increasingly, that has included uh, films made by Utah filmmakers and f including stories about Utah. And we've seen, and so when Kelly asked me to be on this panel, you know, the impact of independent film on communities, a kind of opened sort of, I, I had two different thoughts about it. One is, you know, the showing of independent films and how that can bring communities together. How, you know, through film we can learn and experience, um, you know, what other, other communities, other individuals, other groups are facing and, and find relatable moments um, and learning more about what's happening in the world around us. And one of the things we try to do with those films is to then have a local dialogue where if there's a film about a certain topic, we'll find local organizations, local experts who can then come in and talk about that to topic after the film and relate it to what's going on locally. So that is one sort of direct aspect where I think you know, independent film can have a local impact on communities. But the other piece that really stood out to me was filmmaking and the use of film, uh, the art form, to tell stories, um, to tell Utah stories. And, you know, not being a Utah native, seeing films that are telling, you know, in, informing me about Utah have been fascinating. And that's been a lot of how I've learned about our state. So I really wanted to, you know, bring and engage with filmmakers, you know, producers like Elaine, who through Radio West is making short films about, you know, Utah stories. Radio West is, the, the radio program and their video component is huge, is focused on telling Utah stories. Tyler, with his, you know, films, um, Sons of Perdition and the, um, what was the one about the, the breweries. Oh, Beehive Spirits. Beehive Spirits. Mine was, I'm sorry, I didn't re could remember. 
We, we have a long history of spirits in Utah. It's not yeah. just Canada. Right. Yeah, so, you know, Tyler, all, like Sons of Perdition, which he could talk about more, is a, was a film that he made 10 years ago that was about a, a current topic at the time. And then Beehive Spirits is a film about the history of distilling and alcohol in, in, in Utah. And then Jordan uh, with Dying in Vain is a really contemporary story. So thinking about how filmmakers working you know, in the present, telling stories of the now, are actually creating historical documents that we can look back on and have as a, an opportunity to reflect and, and see what life was like in Utah, you know, as 10 years, like from 10 years ago, what was going on in the news, what was happening, and, and try to br bring that dialogue as film as an art form to, to chronicle and document our, our, our life here. And so, you know, I'm as interested in, in showing these films as I am in watching these films. I want to share them with people. And so, you know, when I see the amazing work that everybody's done here, it's my job to try and curate them and work with my colleagues at the Film Center to build an audience and get people to come and see them. So I'm happy to be part of that, I guess, the food chain of being able to be the exhibitor of, of their work. So I don't know if that gives you a good kind of background on sort of my perspective on the impact of independent film on communities, but you know, it's a big, I think community, the film is a powerful, powerful medium. You know, I think it's the most uh, accessible, the most dynamic, and you know, for audiences, it, can, it really engages people more so, I think, than reading, um, you know, which I don't have a problem with reading. Don't get me wrong, I like to read too, but, sorry, words, what? But I, I think that, you know, the, vi the, vis the visual medium is, you know, it's, it's dominant, and it's dominant for a reason. You know, people can engage with it easily, and I think it's a powerful tool. And so I'd like to kind of give over to some of the, to the producers and filmmakers here to kind of talk about their, their work in telling the stories that you know make up our our world here in Utah. Is it? Yeah, no, I think that's good. I'm mean, just going to add one comment, and it you know as you, as you talk about how it does impact communities, and maybe even more so, seeing a, a documentary, whether it be a short or a full length. We're also continuing to see the rapid progression of technology with the billions, I think it's 4.8 billion people on the planet are, are, are carrying around a smartphone. And they're starting to see Radio West and Video West and, and some of these stories on culture and life yeah. in our state after they've just seen, you know, some, some news from somewhere else maybe around the world. Yeah. So it's, it's very exciting, I think, to see that this ongoing convergence uh, uh, of technology and media and history. What we're doing in a large extent is recording history. So with that, uh, I love the way you introduce filmmakers and, and uh, whether we, maybe what would be best do you guys think? Would we move and look at some Radio West footage or do you want to start with the filmmakers? I'm really going to look to how you think, Patrick, uh, you'd like to well, follow. Well, I mean, I think of Elaine as a filmmaker, you know, exactly. because she's a, you know, she produces and coordinates the, 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 the short films for Radio West. So, you know, maybe I, I think it would be great to hear, what's that? Put in both worlds. Yeah, totally. Radio and video movies. Um, but I think it would be great to maybe hear from, from each of them, like how, what inspired, you know, Elaine, what inspires you or each of you to make films that are about local stories and why you chose to follow those topics and how, how you find the stories then. You know, for you, because you're making so many films, how do you determine what what you're making? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I do sort of live with feet in two worlds because films, how many times have you been on the program? I know Sons of Perdition, Four. Beehive Spirits, uh, certainly An Honest Liar. An honest and, liar. One time. and we featured uh, Dying in Vain as well, and several of her shorts. Um, for us, all of it is about storytelling. Like that is the central, that is our central job. And you know, I hear 
radio station making films? What? Like, I get the question. <laughs> but it's also a way of meeting audience in a new location. You know, as people move away from terrestrial radio, how do we bring them to our podcast? How do we bring them to our conversations? And film has been another way to tell stories, another way to meet new people and bring them in. And the short format, since we're very much a news-driven organization, makes sense for us because we're all about the deadline and the turnaround. <laughs> um, so really every one of them you ask why and how, I would say the why in addition to using film to encounter new people in our community, I think we also know from media as people have access, I mean I can listen to I shouldn't say this out loud. I can listen to WNYC in New York, the public radio station there, just as easily as I can listen to KUER right now. So what makes us distinctive in this community and the conventional wisdom right now is that it's local stories. Because the same story coming out of Washington, D.C. is playing on KQED in San Francisco and on NYC in New York. So what makes us stand out? Why do you choose us? It's because we're covering the legislature. It's because we're featuring local films. It's because we're creating stories, creating films here, uh, creating films about this place. And for us, that can be as much about contemporary stories as it is about historic stories. So if I may. Yes, please. <laughs> I brought a little one for you. Uh, you all are familiar with the Holy Trinity, Trinity Monastery in Huntsville, Utah? They held their final mass. August 27th and there were four monks still living there and we had the chance to go up and talk to them and chronicle their final thoughts as they closed the monastery. So this is about five minutes and then I may make a couple of comments thereafter. What happens to a monastery is what can happen to a family. If uh, parents don't have children, that name of the family may disappear. Well, we haven't had anybody stay for 30 years, do you know that? And kind of tell it set us up, you know. There was a great rush of, of people joining after the Second World War. That's when most of these monasteries were founded with veterans. There's, a, there's still a lot of veterans here. When I came, we had 84 months. All the GIs coming out of the Second World War had 84 months. We used to pick up 50,000 bales of hay by hand. And all, all these books, you know, we had more energy than sense. <laughs> but but you, should have, you should have heard this choir when we had 84 books in it. You're supposed to have senior monks who've been here 60 years, and then a middle aged group of monks, and then juniors. Well, if no one comes, then it's all elderly monks, is what happened here. And now they're so old that they need nursing care. Right now, we're cleaning all the junk out. <laughs> we're human beings and we collect things. So we're cleaning all that out. And we are uh, getting ready to make the move. Then we're, we're in the process of trying to determine what this church will be used for. If it's not used for anything, it'll probably be torn down. When, uh, when they come to visit her, people, they, uh, they find something. And what I tell them is that peace is in their heart already. This sort of brings it out somehow. Because we're not magicians, we can't make things happen that way. But somehow they're touched. The land and, and nature and the surroundings 
Indian Hills and the mountain and the majestic part of it somehow touches a, a soul. What's it feel like to close a monastery? It is very sad. But the singer is a monk in everybody because there's a desire for a completion, for fulfillment. There's an emptiness that calls out to be filled. So there's kind of a two there's kind of two parts to being able to tell the story in film. One is the story itself, actually, and I think history is really well suited for that because when we're telling history, we're working in stories, right? A lot of times I get pitches like, "Oh, you should do a show, or you should do something about this event we're holding." I'm like, I don't want to do it about the event. I want to do it about the stories. That are involved. It's the same way people write history, right? You can talk about the big ideas and the machinations of politics and the individual play, but until you get to the stories, right, that's when you engage people. So history in many ways seems to come, seems to me, partially because I consider myself a big history nerd, um, to come prepackaged with stories. But the challenge in film is also then how do you tell it visually? Because I think we're Many of us are working hard to find new aesthetics. Like you can do the kind of slideshow thing, but you can see in here, I mean, the monastery gave us access to like 2,500 pictures. And, but you know, just looking at those pictures over and over again, we really had to find a way too to use them that was visually engaging and new. And I worked really hard to find some moving images and um, they were actually about two hours from being mailed to Kentucky and the uh, superior who is now going to Ireland to uh, be an abbot there said, well, would some 16 millimeter film help you? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, so we had to get out a big knife to cut all the boxes open and naturally it was in the very last box we could look in. <laughs> so we drag out the 16 millimeter and you know, was able to capture a moment that was footage from 1979 from Channel 4 News um, that they were get, they were going to get rid of when they were cleaning out, and it had ended up at the monastery. So, you know, we're thinking a lot about images and how does it look. So, the other question you ask is where we find stories. Tell me, come tell me what the stories are. Sometimes they'll work, sometimes they won't. <laughs> but and it's never necessarily because of the value of the story, but because of the challenges of good storytelling, good visual storytelling as well. So um, yeah, I, our goal is to be telling these stories and to be creating conversations, whether we're making the film or we're giving a platform for fabulous filmmakers in the state. So thank you very much.
Thanks, Wayne. It's a great little short film. It's nice. Really well put together. They do some really great um, slice of life pieces that are of Utah. Um, and as you guys know, I don't need to explain to you, Utah has unique stories and unique people and a unique history, unlike most any other state. Um, I'm a documentary filmmaker who lives in Utah, and uh, there's a number of reasons why I live in Utah. One, well, I have a son here who I like, and I'm going to stay for that for now. But um, it, it, they, there's so many interesting and unique stories that come from this state that you can't really get anywhere else. And my first documentary, and I, uh, you know, I, I decided to be a filmmaker when I was a kid, and I'd done it my whole life, and I, I came up through, I was doing the gripping and art department and all that stuff, but I decided to make a, a feature documentary. I, I lived, did a lot of commercials for a while, and I decided to do um, one on the Lost Boys, uh, Sons of Perdition is what it was called, um, Warren Jeff's group, and the boys who were routinely uh, excised from that community. And what I found out is that there were probably a dozen filmmakers trying to tell that same story and they were filmmakers of much higher caliber than I, much higher caliber, and they couldn't get access, they couldn't get permission, they couldn't hang around long enough to be able to tell this story. And I was able to meet with these boys and go down, you know, on a moment's notice, and also relate to them, you know, with my history and my family and my background. And so, um, you know, it's cliche, but when you make your first movie or you write your first book, you write something you know. And I knew that story, and I was able to tell that story. Had I been from New York or San Francisco or Los Angeles, I probably couldn't have gotten access to that story, and I probably couldn't have told as effectively. There's a scene in the film, uh, and it opens the film, if you've seen it, where uh, we go into Colorado City, and there's two boys in the back seat, and they want to rescue their 14-year-old sister from the community because she's going to be married to a 60-year-old man the next day. I don't know if you know about polygamy, but, um, and, and they go in the house and she runs out and jumps in the car and says, go, 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 get me out of here. And that, you know, that's a propellant for the entire film. And, you know, a large section of the movie is based upon that. And what happened is that they called us and said, we're going to go get her. Can you be down here in, in two hours? And they live in St. George. <laughs> And so we got in the car and we left as quick as we could. Again, if I lived in LA or New York, I couldn't have done that. So, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons. And then I've, I've made other films. Um, Anonymous Liar was my last film, and it's about a guy named James Randi, the world famous magician who became an investigator of paranormal claims and went after psychics and fake healers and spoon benders. And both films have played very well um, Netflix and worldwide festivals all over the place. Uh, but Sons of Perdition, it just has this life outside of Utah and outside of the country like you wouldn't believe. You wouldn't believe how it plays in Germany and Ireland and Australia and England and just they just watch it and watch it and watch it. Um, of course they think all of us in Utah are but <laughs> but um, and then I, you know I've, I've made other films about Utah and Utah stories and there's one that uh, I'll show which is uh, heavy Utah history and I, I, I wanted to do something for KUED and they do a lot of great little pieces and so I pitched them an idea about the history of alcohol in Utah and, and I did some research on history of alcohol in Utah and alcohol in Utah and that doesn't mean just sitting at the bar I did a little bit of that research but um, <laughs> but I also then profiled in addition to the history of the alcohol in Utah I profiled some of the individuals who uh, the pioneers, if you will, who create alcohol in this state. Um, you know, there's the old cowboy who owns a winery in Moab, and uh, the High West Whiskey, and then um, Squatters Wasatch Beer, Greg Scherf. So I'm going to show just a, a little clip of uh, a piece of this film, and it kind of has deals with just the history of alcohol in Utah, which is surprising to probably even you, more surprising to people on the outside. See if I can find that. I'd help you, but I'm pretty screwed up. Yeah, I'm I'm a Mac guy, so this is like getting on a. In the 1850s, when the pioneers came, distilling was a way of life. You didn't have uh, anesthesia. You didn't have antibiotics. If you had to cut off the leg, you had whiskey. You poured the whiskey on the on the wound. Uh, so the pioneers made a, a whiskey called Valley Tan. Valley Tan was slang for a term that meant anything that the pioneers 
uh, made from scratch. On a visit to Salt Lake, Mark Twain wrote at the local liquor, the exclusive Mormon refresher, Valley Tan is a kind of whiskey, first cousin to it, is of Mormon invention and manufactured only in Utah. Tradition says it is made of imported fire and brimstone. <laughs> One of Mark Twain's drinking partners was the notorious Porter Rockwell, who was Utah's first lawman and bodyguard to both Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. He's just one ugly, scary dude, and we put his picture on our Valley Tan label. Porter Rockwell helped guide Mormon pioneers to the Utah Territory and establish a settlement which included one of Utah's first breweries in Lehigh. The Hot Springs Brewery Hotel. Probably it was a pretty rough and tumble place considering Porter Rockwell's reputation. And That's Del Vance. He's owner of the Beer Hive Tavern in Salt Lake and author of the book Beer and the Beehive. He uh, was not the kind of guy you want to walk out on your beer tab. He'd probably track you down and either make you pay it or kill you, or both. Yeah, he was that kind of guy. Very important. Mormons weren't originally so strongly against liquor as they became. Joseph Smith ran a hotel with a bar in, a, in Nauvoo. ZCMI stocked liquor. The Hotel Utah served liquor. Here's a man that would know. Uh, my name's Rod Decker. I'm a reporter at KUTV. I'm writing a book about Utah politics, so I have occasion to look into liquor a little. <laughs> Salt Lake City, at 87, if I remember correctly, saloons before the turn of the 20th century. A lot of saloons. It was, it was a rough western town. Utah was a, a major attraction for miners, uh, tourists, people heading west, homesteaders, and they would all be thirsty by the time they reached here. It's a desert. Utah may have been a desert, but it certainly wasn't dry. Saloons and taverns lined the streets of Salt Lake City. By 1857, Main Street had so many saloons that locals referred to it as Whiskey Street. There were saloons in Salt Lake City, but the real saloon towns were the mining towns. Saloons were the center of rowdy mining towns like Vernal, Bingham Canyon, Park City, and a little party town named Corinth. The Mormons called it the city of the ungodly. It was a small town out by the Great Salt Lake, and it had just 1,500 residents, but over 20 bars and saloons. The mining towns were pretty much the impetus for the growth of the brewing industry in Utah. Miners loved to imbibe. Breweries both large and small dotted the Salt Lake Valley, including the Bavarian Brewery, and the Philadelphia Brewery, both located in downtown Salt Lake City, and Park City's California Brewery, built in 1884. And then there's Wagner's Brewery, at the mouth of Emigration Canyon. Ironically, Utah became the home of some of the largest breweries in the entire western U.S. There was Becker's in Ogden, and Fisher's Brewery west of Salt Lake on the Jordan River. But none was bigger than the Salt Lake City Brewing Company, which produced an astonishing 100,000 barrels of beer a year. The place occupied one and a half city blocks. One of the major benefits to having a lot of breweries and, and distilleries is that they generate a lot of revenue. In fact, more than two-thirds of the territory's revenue came from selling alcohol. Mormons who ran things then allowed liquor to be distributed, but they taxed it enormously. The taxes in Salt Lake City on liquor were um, five or six times the taxes in Chicago. What, one of the funniest things about the, the state of Utah is that it probably wouldn't exist today without the breweries and the, and the early wineries and distilleries. Utah did become a state in 1896, and not long after, joined the growing cry for prohibition and the end of alcohol in America. During this period, the Mormon church gradually became stronger against liquor and tobacco. The word of wisdom moved from a principle to a rule. As it did so, most of the brethren became more favorable to prohibition. Attempts to enact prohibition were passed in the 1909 and 1915 sessions of the state legislature, but they were vetoed by the Republican governor, William Spry. But then came 1916, a very important election year. The Democratic candidate was Simon Bamberg, 
the second Jew ever to be governor of a state in America. He had immigrated from Germany, he spoke with a German accent, he owned railroads, he owned coal mines, and he owned lagoon. He ran on prohibition, saying, if you elect me, I will enact prohibition. And to prove he was sincere, he said, I quit selling beer at Lagoon and it cost me $5,000. The, the Democrats were elected in a landslide. The first thing they did was enact a bone dry prohibition bill. Utah's really not well known for setting the pace in the country. In fact, we're usually known for being a few years behind. But when it came to prohibition, Utah was ahead of the game. Utah ratified prohibition in 1917, two years earlier than the rest of the country. The night of prohibition, the streets were full of people. Downtown, everyone stayed up late and got drunk. The Deseret News editorialized. It said, prohibition will be the greatest benefit to mankind since Jesus Christ. On January 17, 1920, Congress passed the Volstead Act. Prohibition took effect nationwide. It banned the sale, the production, and the consumption of alcohol. The United States went dry. So that, that's just a section of the film, obviously. It's a lot longer. And then, of course, we go into a bit about uh, Utah's very significant importance in uh, repealing prohibition, if you know that story. Uh, and I won't spoiler alert. Spoiler, <laughs> <laughs> you can get a beer in Utah. <laughs> but uh, again, like it's such a great story. It's such a unique, contrasting story of alcohol in a dry state uh, and uh, in a typically very Mormon state. So uh, I've made a number of films about Utah and in Utah. Uh, one of the films that I am, er, you know, in early production on is a very important Utah film, and it's about. Uh, document forgery, and of course, it is features are the, probably the greatest document forger of all time, Mr. Mark Hoffman, and uh, all the events around Mr. Hoffman, and of course, Mr. Mayfield is here right now, who is very prominent in that, uh, very important in the case. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I like Utah stories. I like Utahns. I like the contrast and the ironies and the difficulties, and the, the there is a core of Utah documentarians that live in the state, and it, 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 it rivals any major city outside of New York and LA. It really does, unquestionably. <laughs> it, yeah, don't let them care. But they're really, they, they're making films out of Utah, and some of them are Utah stories, and some of them are not Utah stories. And there's this element of storytelling that is ingrained in us as Utahns, and this element of uh, 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 of, of telling what we believe, and it, it really sets the tone for making documentary film. So I'm happy to uh, be a part of it. Thanks, Tyler. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, my name's Jordan Saxton Hackney, and I work with filmmaker Jenny McKenzie, uh, who focuses primarily on social impact documentary films. Um, I am a native Utah, born and raised, went to school here, went to college here, I'm getting my master's here. I try to leave <laughs> and I can't. I love it. It's where my family is, it's where I've grown up. I have roots here. Um, and that's how I became involved with Jenny McKenzie. Um, I'm a Utah with a story, as, as many of you are. Uh, my brother died in 2014 of a heroin overdose. And at that time, my family felt that it was very important for us to share our story and to share my brother's story in hopes of helping to educate other Utahns, other Americans, other people in the world about what's going on uh, with the opiate crisis. Um, and that's where Jenny McKenzie came in and really just artfully included my brother's story and my story in the film. Um, and which has really informed a lot of the work that we've been doing now. Um, so we talk about you know, film being one of the most important artistic avenues, but I really think it's really just all about stories and how that's just a huge vehicle for change and really what we're trying to do with this film now. And um, So I have been a subject in the film, but I also do now work for Jenny as the outreach coordinator. So not only is this part of my history, but I've made it part of my future um, in being able to help spread awareness about this issue. Um, so I want to go ahead and play 
just some of the clips that I brought, but I need to yeah. get this entered in. Yeah, yeah, let's see. See if it can get yeah. loaded up. I think it is. Right. I'm sorry to be a little underprepared. It's just been uh, one of those days for me. Um, but often something that I, I hear people ask um, about Utah in particular is why we, are, we were fourth in the nation. Uh, we are now, I believe, seventh in the nation, but it's not because we've done in, in opiate deaths. It's not because we've done anything better. It's just that other states have gotten worse. Um, and it, I, I'm not going to try and answer that question, and we sort of offer some some explanation for it um, in the film that, that I'll show you as well. But you know, it is it, it's an American problem, but it's also a Utah problem. Um, so the clip the that here? I have, yes, so started at thirty-seven fifteen. And how far does it go? I have it till 48.35. That might be a little long. Okay. Well, I can just see it here too. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Thanks. Critical long term. Treatment with heroin addiction. It's fairly complex because you've got the addiction but 99% of the time, you've got some reason why they were particularly vulnerable. We feel anybody who struggles with substance abuse is self-medicating an underlying emotional issue or psychological issue. Kids don't really have an opportunity to get to know themselves or get to know the world around them in a meaningful way. And I think that they get lost. There is this kind of assumption of your persona being okay and not flawed and not having issues as being the only reflection that you're allowed to have. I'm seeing a ton of trauma and the thing about trauma is there's often so much shame associated with that. Sometimes it's a trauma with a capital T. Something obvious and really bad has happened. But then there's the small t trauma a lot of little things over time that build up and really give the young person a message that they're bad. I guarantee you there is shame involved in their drug addiction. The shame is so toxic. Shame becomes the psychological driver of addiction. We differentiate between guilt and shame in treatment. We say guilt is I did something bad, shame is I am bad. Guilt's good. It produces accountability and change in behavior. No one can get better if they are feeling shame because if you are bad, what would you do about that? So imagine the shame coming from that vision of what your life will look like to looking in the mirror and saying, I'm a heroin addict. And the shame and the self-hatred, they dance together. And they keep dancing until it's treated. I mean, if you think about the ideal time to intervene upon an addict's life, it's when they come to the emergency department in withdrawal, they're miserable, they want to stop, and you have nothing to offer them. I took care of a guy the other night, and he said I went to jail for three years, and he said that's really the only time that I was able to, to get sober. But doesn't that seem crazy? I mean, would we incarcerate a non-controlled diabetic? No. Right. I mean, doesn't that sound like an <laughs> asinine thought? And, and, and yet, isn't addiction a disease? Yeah. And yet, sometimes our best solution is incarceration. We have plenty of opiates to offer them, but we have no help to offer them. Primarily because the vast majority of our patients who come in in that situation are unfunded. There's not enough substance abuse treatment out there. And, and it's, it's really sad because I think we're really missing an opportunity to save a lot of lives. The resources for help aren't there as it would be for diabetes or hypertension or heart disease. And until we make that shift, a society will continue to struggle. There is a baseline level of care 
that we feel is due to everyone for any medical condition. It, it, it isn't translating in the world of addiction. The resources are not getting dedicated to it. So an addict comes in and they may request help. Depending upon their insurance, depending upon the financial and family resources that they have, they'll be given different options, which is a little disconnected from the traditional practice of medicine. It makes treatment variable. When it doesn't work, we hope there'll be a next time. People throughout this state have folks living within their neighborhoods and they don't know they're addicts. They don't talk about that they're addicts. They don't support each other through their addiction. And that's a cultural thing here. We don't, we don't talk about things that aren't pretty. I'm sad for my state, fifth in the nation. Come on, we're one of the healthiest living places. You see article after article, healthy living, Utah. Healthy unless you happen to get into opiates and then you're dead. Dear mom and dad, please help me quit doing heroin. I had to write this because I'm too ashamed and scared of actually quitting this drug to ask you for help in person. But here is the honest truth. I cannot quit this drug on my own. I need your help. I'm going to write out how I would like you to help me. One, I need to still live with you so I have people to whom I have to be accountable to. Two, maybe most importantly, I need to delete all drug dealers numbers from my phone and change my number. Three, what I want is to go to a doctor and get help with just the most serious problems. Not being able to sleep, serious anxiety and panic attacks around not using. Please, help me quit doing heroin. He had a lot of demons and struggles that he was trying to work through and didn't really know how to do it. And I think his writing his feelings down has given me an opportunity to get to know him on his real, true, genuine level of what he was really going through internally that he, for some reason, never felt like he could share with anybody. Um, and I think that's a lot of addicts have that same problem because they feel so shameful and bad about being an addict for one and you know you know doing all the things that they do to get their drugs so I, they they're sad but again i would have never known any of that had he not written it down i knew he was struggling of course obviously we all did but he never shared any of that with us my parents are obviously grieving differently and processing this in different ways. My dad is so angry, just angry at the world, at himself, angry at Chase. The day that Chase died was the first time he started a Facebook. He would post photos of Chase, of him and Chase. My dad will write, you know, me and my best friend Chase. That is probably the most tragic part to me. I think something that my dad really wanted, but for some reason or another didn't happen. And now that he's gone, um, that's something that I think my dad really wishes had happened. I wish, I think he wishes that they were closer. Um, he wishes that they had been best friends. They don't deserve to be taken because they didn't get enough tries. They don't deserve to be taken because there weren't resources. All addiction is life-threatening, but for the heroin addict, it's just gonna get you faster. You can look in any you know obituary section, any paper in America, and there's 22, 23 year old kids in there, and those kids don't die of natural causes. I guess what's important to most people is whether it's your kid. If somebody's cancer comes back and they relapse, we don't say you didn't chemo hard enough. We're not going to support you. Look at that for addiction. 
we don't give people the impression that their lives matter and we don't say this method of treatment didn't work for you let's try this one we have the antidote to save someone from an opiate overdose we have had it for years and decades it's naloxone anyone who works in an er anyone who works in an ambulance rig they will tell you it works somebody overdoses they give naloxone they're not dead they used to be able to get a vial of naloxone for less than a dollar I can't get it for less than $15 right now. I started asking for funding in December. By the time everything was approved and the applications were through and I got a check in June, the price had doubled in that short time. That, that's not, that's not the way this is supposed to work. You have this vision of what you want an outreach to look like. One of my goals is to get kind of an army of people who are trained to teach people about overdose recognition, overdose prevention, because it isn't all just about rescue for me. I'm guesstimating it was about 60-ish that we got out you need for today. Yeah, count out, and then let's put everything into that one. So two doses of naloxone, two syringes, info packet. Yeah, keep the oranges out so we can put those on top for people who want to actually have a feel for the syringes. Yeah. Okay, there's some spares if you need them. I mean, Sam and I are good, but we need resources and we need help. And more importantly, I think we need a global acceptance. Plenty of my friends have been saying, boy, you've been talking about this a long time. So there's some justice in that, I suppose, that it's finally gotten there. A little too late for Andy, a little too late for hundreds and thousands of others, but that's how I kind of got here. When you die, your brain stops. And what you really are, are the electronic impulses in your brain. Once those cease to take place, your person, you, your memories, everything that you've experienced, thought, felt, done, is gone. You are like a star. You are born, you live your life creating memories, experiences, interactions with other people. Some people have small gravity, and when they die, they slowly peter out. Some people are huge stars with massive gravity affecting everything around them. Let's take a deep breath. That's really heavy stuff. So again, my hope and my family's hope um, is that Chase's star has a larger gravity and that it is his story and our story uh, is affecting others, is helping others, is helping to change what's going on in our society with, with drug abuse, with opiate abuse. Um, we spent a lot of time isolated and scared and fearful, not talking about it, not asking for help, not reaching out. Um, and so that's what I've been working with Jenny McKenzie on, is creating an outreach and education strategy with this film. Um, we've created a sex successful screening model uh, where we take the film and we've taken it across the country to universities, colleges, camp college campuses in uh, Washington DC, in New York, in New Jersey, we'll have one in Arizona coming up here in Utah, we just finished um, a statewide tour from Moab to Price to Vernal and then to Logan screening the film. We just screened with uh, the Utah Film Center at the library. We actually had to do an encore screening because we had so many people coming out. Um, so this is an issue that people care about. This is an issue that people are invested in. And um, through these screenings, we're hoping to provide people with an opportunity to start those conversations that we felt too isolated to have, um, to bring this issue out of the closet. Um, and that's really what we're trying to use this film as a vessel to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Jordan and everybody. Uh, th these are just a small sampling of the type of local films and stories that you uh, see exhibited by the Utah Film Center. Uh, my daughter.
Dr. Carly is here who works with the Utah Film Center. They screen every week. Uh, Rose Wagner Library, and I think sometimes at the Leonardo, I believe. Uh, is there, so I would encourage you, if you haven't, to, to get out to these screenings uh, beyond the local stories and films that you see as represented here today. There's a lot of great international stories as well. And there's uh, one tonight please. at 7 at the Rose Wagner. <laughs> yeah, what's being tonight, Carly? Uh, Icarus. Icarus, that's right. That's Russian right. Doping in the Olympics, the director will be there. Oh. Rose Wagner, 7. And I hope for like this session today, what always makes for me the screenings uh, so rich uh, are, the, are the filmmakers that are thereafter. And, and you really get a sense of, of why they made the film and uh, get some more insight to it. And I can attest with uh, these filmmakers, uh, they'll have you wanting to come back and see more. And I think it's so important that, that, that there are these outreach programs and I commend Jenny and you and your family for doing this because I, I, I we all uh, have some experience either in this state or around the country with what is an epidemic and when you see uh, a screening of 250 people and 200 turned away um, that's going to continue I think to happen so I, I think it pretends good things for your film and, and the impact I know it's going to have so um, before we uh, thank our panel i am open up just for a few minutes if there's some questions uh, I'd be happy to uh, just pass the mic maybe. Oh, sure. Sure. Such a big room. <laughs> I have a question. Actually, today at our keynote address, Ken Verdoya talked about the fact that he, he said he wasn't a filmmaker. He was absolute about that. Mm -hmm. But he did say about his storytelling in his life, he's now sort of introduced or perceived to be a historian. And because this is sort of a, a history conference, my question to you as filmmakers, you're telling a story in this moment in time, all of you. But how, how do you think about sort of where your stories are going to sit in a historical context? Or do you worry about that or think about that? I'd be interested to know what you think. I mean, I, I hadn't thought about Ken Verdoya in that way, but he's joined the world of the history club. We're going to let him in. We taught him the handshake <laughs> a little bit. But, um, but it's interesting to me because you are telling very contemporary stories that, we, that are relevant to our lives. But how do you think about them when you're making them about where they're going to sit in the context of history? This is something that we're actually thinking about a lot in terms of film and in terms of audio stories that we're also capturing right now as a station. Um, how And part of this is we have a new station man manager who's interested in this and I, I, I sort of self-confess to my amateur historian-ness. Um, I think about archiving a lot. I recently, uh, about a year ago, came across a cache of DAT tapes that are about this big and have luckily been in a cool enough facility <laughs> that I, they, so they were all from the mid 90s, stories from the mid 90s, um, which, not the 1890s, the <laughs> 1990s. I mean, it was only 20 years ago, but even digitizing those was really interesting for me to compare what were we talking about as journalists 20 years ago and what are we talking about as journalists today and you know how they say nothing's new under the sun <laughs> let me tell you guys that um so there were so many stories that were the same and we've actually been talking about ways like are the partnerships we should be pursuing that would be archiving these kinds of stories because you know it, I, I, as I'm doing my personal projects and looking at newspaper resources that that Utah has done so well to digitize their newspaper or the uh, historic photographs of which were in full force in what we saw from the Beehive Spirits. All right, what will, what will historians have in a hundred years to talk about this time right now? Our images are fleeting, or we're just inundated by them you know how do you sort that out what's important and I think journalism and filmmakers still have a role to play in saying in in, in helping resources bubble to the, helping stories bubble to the top helping create an archive of this moment in time or the last 70 years of the monastery or how we were thinking about history right now like with beehive spirits here are all these people who are brewers reflecting back in time. So what I hope is that we are we are creating an archive, and I think it's a challenge for us um, as filmmakers, as librarians, as historians, 
what is going to be important in 50 years, in 100 years, how will people look back on us? And I hope that we're contributing in some way to that. Uh, you know, whenever you pitch a documentary to someone, a broadcaster or a distributor nowadays, and you'll say, well, this happened in 1872, or this happened, like the Hoffman story, this happened in 1986. Well, they go, oh, great, but how does it affect us now? They always want to know how the audience will relate to it now. Um, and like I said, Beehive Spirits, it shows the pioneers making alcohol then, and the pioneers in making alcohol now. Sons of Perdition showed uh, the polygamy in Utah, and the struggle, and the struggle now. And an honest liar. I made this film about a guy, and he literally turned over to me a boxes of VHS tapes of every hundreds of uh, uh, television appearances he's been on in film. And we show the past and now. And you know, I, I like to see the storyline current with the past and how they relate. And you're seeing a lot of films now in the world we live in now um, with you know the deception of the past and the Vietnam film that was just done. That was equally about, let's not let that happen again, as much as it was about the war itself. So that's why I like, kind of a snapshot of now and then. And, and I think a lot of distributors uh, are aware that audiences want it a little bit now. So they force the filmmaker into it. Yes, sir. Uh, this is about the last clip. Yeah. You have vocal dialogue over music. I have a problem with if I become disinterested in the dialogue, do I block it out to hear the music? Or do I block the music out to hear the dialogue? What's the artistical reason for, for this combination? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I am an amateur <laughs> filmmaker, uh, but I imagine it's a highlight an emotional uh, sense that, that or to, to convey an emotional feeling through the music um, that accentuates what's being said. Um, what would you guys say? As professional Can you filmmakers? reduce the music by about 50 decibels? <laughs> <laughs> if we did, you wouldn't hear it. 50 decibels is a lot to <laughs> reduce something by. Um, so I'm an audio editor as well since I'm in radio. Um, spot on about the emotion. It also it also provides momentum in a story. Those moments of silence are as important as the moments of dialogue. And there is a there is a there is a science to the balance. There's no question about that. And I hear films and I'm like, why the heck is their music so loud? Or I edited the monk film and got dressed down because why the heck was the music so low once it went online you couldn't hear it so suddenly I'm like up at seven in the morning <laughs> back at work at seven in the morning yes, fixing the audio because it is it is crucial um, but you're right it, it is an important balance to create so it is something especially the in the audio stage that we think about a lot I think there's a propensity to use music too often a lot of times in film myself but yes ma'am I have a question about the balance of the visual and the narrative. This is really hard. Um, it takes an artist to do it, I guess. But um, in storytelling, we use lots and lots and lots of words. But it's important not to have too many and get to the point. And Ken Verdoya gave an example today about how he started out with 50,000 words and had to get down to, or whatever it was, yeah. a very small number. And I think that really spoke volumes to me. Um, and it's it, it, the picture can say a thousand words, but it's critical to have the right words at the right time with the picture, and that is the tough one. <laughs> so how do you do that? Well, uh, you know, you, you say Ken had to pull 25,000 words down to 10, or whatever it may be. I mean, uh, you know, we shot film for the Sons of Perdition was two and a half years. There was hundreds of hours of footage. I'm sure Jenny's film was- Three years. You know, hundreds of hours of footage that you deal with. I mean, An Honest Liar had, not just two years of filming, but hundreds of hours of archival. So uh, it, it's really about the restraint to show the most. My favorite quote comes from uh, uh, Billy Wilder, the great director, and he said, let the audience figure out two plus two and they'll love you for it. So I, I always like to pull is four, yeah, four, in case you know. <laughs> um, uh, I always say like, 
the less the better. You know, it, it little, and that sometimes as a filmmaker, it's so hard because you want to go, God, I just, I love that scene, or I love that shot, or I love that moment, and that's why you have an editor. Um, <laughs> you know, the old saying, I think it was Spielberg who said, uh, the, the editor, the writer, the director has to have no respect for the writer, and the editor has to have no respect for the director. Um, it, it, film editors have this ability to just take a scene that you love and you worked on and you think is great and just go, it doesn't work, and they throw it out and you go, but no one will see that ever again. <laughs> and it takes someone like that, but a lot of times some people don't have that restraint. You have to think about the, um, I think we have to think about the attention span mm -hmm. of our media landscape right now too. I mean, I showed you a five minute piece, which was the result of uh, about an hour and 15 minutes of the interview and two trips to Huntsville and 2,500 pictures and 45 minutes of 60 millimeter film. There would have been more, but the bulb burst and we couldn't find a replacement bulb in time to get the film. So, I mean, all of these, but you know that telling a story, it doesn't matter if people don't listen to it. So being economical and finding finding the moments that capture people's emotion, that keeps their attention, and then letting them go on to the next thing. Because for better or for worse, that is the world we live in. And if you go too long, like I am with this answer, people <laughs> stop paying attention and start raising their hands. <laughs> I, you know, here's what I want. All of us in this room are either uh, historians by academia or through popular you know, public history. What is, and we all know we have ideas that we would love to see made into a film. How would you, what is the most successful way to pitch that film idea to one of you up there? E. Clark, know me on the end at okay. KUER.org. That's my email address. Um, the most successful way, I, it, it, what is the story? I mean, I get, a lot of times I get why you should tell this story or why this story is important or, I need to get word out about this and I want you to do it for me. Those are the things I hear all the time. And what I want to know is, what is the story and what is it about? And often my next question is, well, what about it? You know, I think we're going to do a panel on education, as an example. Great, that's really important. I believe in education. What about it? Well, about education. Well, tell me more. What's the story? What is this about? You know, and I would say also if there are resources that you know, uh, visual resources that you know, who are the people that I would talk to about that? You know, what are the visual elements that are available? Because as you as you say, telling the story visually is as important is maybe more. I don't know which one. They're both the same. Important in telling the story. You know, um, most of the films I've done have come from people saying, oh, I know a story, or I have an idea, or you should check out this person, or somebody tells a story and I, I, I start to film it or whatever it may be. But you have to understand that, like we just said, like films take years. And uh, you know, Elaine has a, a, a be, an outlet, a she has a place. <laughs> if I'm going to make a film and someone says, you should make this film, and I go, my God, that's a great film, but can I raise money for it? Is there enough footage? Is there a place I could do it? Is there, will it play in Australia so I can make my money back? And am I willing to live above the store for the next three years of my life in order to tell this story? So I wouldn't be offended if someone says, I just can't do it. And if someone says, I should do it, you should be leery of them too, because are they going to give X amount of their time, passion, heart, energy, money to the project and the subject? But yes, I'd love to hear your idea. <laughs> so, the other thing is, is with technology today, you can start making it yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could take, if you needed to, wanted to interview people to capture their stories, you could do that on your iPhone. So, you know, the, shh, I'm just saying. <laughs> 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 you know, I'm trying to empower the stories, to tell stories. You know, come on. But no, I, I think that, yeah, like there, uh, for me watching the films today, there is a wide range of films. There's films about historical events in Utah, as you were saying earlier, about more contemporary issues. And then, you know, with Tyler's film, Sons of Perdition, which is now his history, because it was 10 years ago, but it was current when he made it. I think that, you know, one of the other things I was thinking about watching the clips for uh, Beehive Spirits is, 
you know, I was much, I'm much more engaged with an hour and a half film about the history of alcohol and liquor laws in Utah than I would have been reading a 200 page book about it. So I think that there's certain topics that, you know, lend well to, to a visual format. And as historians, like you are the keeper of stories. And I think that you should, you could experiment and try to, to chronicle those stories in your areas of expertise. I also think about the, the, the Howard's in the, like, history of the people and when I think of you know films like Dying in Vain it's not the academic it's not you know geopolitical history that you would read in a textbook that's more of you know what's happening at the human level and I think that that's something that we can all you know we can all do a, a we can all tell that story in some way just to add to that quickly, it brings to mind that I found a cassette tape in behind a filing cabinet the other day, which was a first person, which was an oral history of Clarion in 1969. And I just about lost my <laughs> stuff. I was like, I'm gonna make a film, oh my God. Unfortunately, the tape was, um, like was not audible. So that was a painful moment for me. But we're living in a we're living in a time now where we're creating formats that have better lifespans. So, you know, go out there and do those things. They may be the basis of something later. That clarion tape would have been the basis of something, but <laughs> unfortunately it's not now. You know, don't rule out that it doesn't have to be a film. I just did a twenty minute podcast documentary for NPR that you know and, and podcasts now I mean those documentary podcasts are amazing they're so well done so it could be something as simple as that yeah. does everyone listen to the memory palace by the way yeah. oh if you're a historian you've got to listen that's the best <laughs> it is. we got one minute I'm getting a flag at the back maybe just uh, any other questions